Having a host is one of my favorite ways to truly elevate a church service. But what even is a host? What do they do? Well, in my view, there are seven items every church needs to know about hosting. And if you're hesitant, I've even got word for word script options for you closer to the end of the video. Let's dive in. Well, hey there, and welcome to the Bro Church Tool Show. We're here to help you and your church navigate the biggest communication shift in 500 years. I'm Brady Shearer, your host. I'm joined as always by my co-host. We call him Archbishop Aperture. It's Alexander Mills. Hello, hello. Seven things your church needs to know about hosting. Let's mm -hmm. dive in right away to number one, answering the question, what even is a host to begin with? Well, if you think of announcements as a baseline, Surely we're all familiar with the person that delivers announcements in church. Maybe mm -hmm. it's the same person each week. Maybe you have a rotating cast of characters. That's the baseline for a host. But then we add giving, we add guest acknowledgement, we add the connect card, and per perhaps most importantly, transitions mm. and kind of managing the fluidity both for the people that are in the seats and are experiencing the church programming and service, but also for everyone that's volunteering and coming on and off the stage, and they have a role to play in the Sunday morning as well, making sure that that's all coordinated also. That's the first thing. Number two, okay, but why? That's mm. the what, but why? For me, the goal with a host is to build trust, it's to propel people to take action, and to ensure fluidity throughout the service. Now, when I say fluidity, I can hear in my head the critics saying, why would we care about that whatsoever? And so I just want to read this YouTube comment, okay? It says, quote, we switched over to having a host about one and a half years ago. Total game changer. As associate pastor, I have many responsibilities throughout the week, but on Sunday mornings, my job description is, quote, Sunday morning experience, <laughs> unquote. I coordinate with the worship pastor and the senior pastor to create fluid transitions of worship into new person, greeting, announcements, and giving, and then transition to the message. It has transformed our service from a clunky piecemeal order to a fluid, connected experience. Wow. If you think about your church's programming, each element of a Sunday morning has a distinct purpose. And for the congregation to engage in that distinct purpose, you're kind of going from like one station mm -hmm. to the next. We're gonna worship. There's gonna be a fast song. There's gonna be a slow song. And we're gonna read scripture. And we're gonna do offering. And we're gonna do communion. And now that's time for the sermon. And now there's time for response. And so there needs to be direction given. There needs to be fluidity between the different orders of programming or, or else it can kind of be disorienting when you are in one thing and then you enter into another. Yeah, we talked about this actually last week on the show. The episode was about 10 things that churches do that kind of scare off new visitors. And one of the things that, that came up, one explicitly, um, w one of the things that we talked about was lack of structure in a service. But it came up a few times in some of the the comments that came in from folks saying like, hey, as a new visitor, this is the thing that's like, that just makes me feel disoriented in a church service. And the host job serves to actually um, touch on on multiple areas of this and to address the this thing we're talking about, which is the fluidity of the experience that we are trying to curate. You know, you and I recently had a dinner at a restaurant in Montreal. It's funny, I was thinking about the exact same thing. And we had three dinners, three nights in a row, three just top tier restaurants. And the one that stood out, the food was great, all, like across the board, right? But the one that stood out- Was when the host insulted me? Nope. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> no, the one that stood out was when we had a server who made the entire evening feel like effortless and fun and set the pace for what we were about to experience. And in hindsight, we sat, we were there for like three hours. Like, like it was like maybe one of the longest meals I've ever had in a restaurant. And it felt, it did not feel like it lingered for one moment. What I'm trying to say is he took control of our experience and catered it for us in a way that that just made it feel good. And that's part of the essential role that the host plays um, beyond just announcing what we're fundraising for and this, that, and the other. But they kind of are, are the glue that holds each piece of the service together that, that really serves to accomplish like a fluid feeling experience. Um, and, you know, we, we said on last week's episode, we're gonna say it again on this show, like a lot of the, a lot of the folks who work in church, maybe folks who are listening to this show, haven't been a new visitor, haven't haven't been on the the receiving end of a church experience for a while. So maybe we 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 tend to get a little bit out of touch with like how 
our church service is experienced or even perceived, the host ensures that everything is flowing and that anyone who shows up in the room, whether they are a longtime member or a first time visitor, feels like, oh, we were we were moving in a direction. And I feel like someone guided me along that entire journey. Two primary objectives for the host at church. Number one, get trust and buy-in from the congregation. And number two, propel them to get involved and right. take a next step. Right. You want to think about a host at a restaurant. If you've ever been at a restaurant and you've been with someone or you've asked this question yourself, what would you recommend? You're doing that because you want to have the best experience possible mm. and you're putting trust in that host, in that server to guide you in the right direction. And hopefully they point you in the right direction. Right. Otherwise, you might choose something that you're not having a great time with. Similarly, not identically, similarly in church, you as the host are basically creating space for the people that are seated in the pews to fully give their all in the church service. And so they understand we're doing this now, then we're doing this. This is the purpose of this part of the programming. This is how I'm expected to get involved. This is the purpose of this program. And this is what is expected from me. When you tie all those pieces together as a host, and we have, you know, word by word scripts that we're going to get to here in a moment. When you tie all those things together mm -hmm. as the host, you create the environment for the people in the congregation to fully buy in. Yes. And that's why fluidity matters. Right. It's not just about like, we are so good at creating this perfect show. <laughs> yeah. You would never see a show like this anywhere in church. It's so smooth. It's like, no, we're not doing it for that purpose, mm -hmm. but what that actually does accomplish is greater effectiveness in service, why are we hosting services? We believe so that people can be formed into the ways of Jesus. Yeah. And that often involves them doing things. Mm -hmm. You cannot become a disciple, you cannot be a disciple separate from doing because be is a verb. Mm -hmm. Becoming a disciple, becoming is a verb. You have to be doing things. And so attending church is one thing, but you can just sit there and leave unchanged because you're not getting yes. involved with the certain parts of the programming. Yes. So that's why we do it. Say fluidity, people are like, church is all about a show. It's all about a show. You guys are just aesthetic this, aesthetic that. <laughs> That's how they talk. <laughs> yeah, yes. That's how we hear well, Those people comments. deserve dignity, Braid. That's Stop right. <laughs> characterizing them like that. Okay, number four on our list here. The host connects pieces of the service for the congregation, but they're also the connector behind mm. the scenes. Now, this isn't the visible part of a host. And so if you've never served in this role in church, it might not be something that's on your radar because you see what the host is doing on stage, but there's a lot happening behind the scenes as well. We got this commenter on YouTube. It says this, we use the term MC or master of ceremonies for this same thing. The idea I try to get into their heads is that the MC or host is not just the announcement giver. I like the term master of ceremonies because the MC needs to be the master of everything and over everything that's going on from getting people into their seats on time to making sure all of the presenters and band are ready to go on time to keeping the flow going through to the end, all the things, but host is also a very good term for it along with MC. I also recommend that they consider that even if we don't have quote unquote newcomers, we always have guests. Mm. They could be visitors, regular attendees, or, and this is important, members who have not come for quite a while and may feel out of place or a bit like a stranger. The host can help make sure they feel welcome. I love that part of the end mm -hmm. of that comment because one of the feedback, pieces of feedback we get when we talk about this kind of thing is like, look, my church, nobody new comes. Right. And it's, I think it's useful to set a more broad definition mm -hmm. for what a newcomer uh, might be. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also love this idea of just making sure people are in church on time. You know, uh, in a previous life, when I hosted in church, we did this part of hosting. We don't do this anymore. Where when the countdown was going, basically I would come out with like two minutes left mm -hmm. and I would be on stage and say, hey, we're excited to get things started here. If you haven't found a seat, blah, blah, blah. And it was all in an effort to basically cue people, give them yeah. the cue needed that, hey, it's time to get back in your seat. Mm -hmm. You ever been to uh, a, a live show? Mm -hmm. What do they do during intermission? Flick the lights. Yeah. They flick the lights while you're getting uh, some concessions, while you're hitting the restroom. Why? Oh, second act yeah. is about to begin. Is that because they want the show to be seamless and the flow and the fluidity? No, it's like, you need to be in your seat yeah. or else you're going to miss something. So it sounds, like, it sounds like you need a certain type of person to be this type of host, which is like a master of ceremonies to this comment. Someone who's not only good at public speaking and can handle the microphone on stage, but someone on the back end who is like, who is skilled at keeping all the pieces together and having a little bit of foresight to see like, 
Um, what are we going to need uh, in this area and this area? It seems like you need a certain type of person to be an effective host. Yeah, I think uh, there's probably some merit to that. But what I would say is I think that would let some people off the hook and mm. say, oh, we don't have that personality or I'm not that personality. Here's what I see on a Sunday morning. The worship team has worked really hard on getting their songs prepared. And the pastor has worked very hard at getting their sermon ready. And the person who's going to give announcements has not worked hard at mm. all on it. And that's mm. why the announcements are going to be awful in every single church. The worship leader and the pastor have probably not given that much thought to the fluidity of service. Mm. Or if they have, it, it can't be in the highest spot of prominence because they have another task where they're the only one on stage and they have to focus on this. So if there's nothing you take from this episode, it should be this. Installing a host where that's their primary responsibility is the most important part of having a host to begin with. Mm. Because when you leave it to the worship pastor, when you leave it to the person that's delivering announcements, when you leave it to the lead pastor, suddenly it's not their biggest focus. And then we go, oh, you know, I just don't have the bandwidth for this, or we don't have the right person for it. You don't have any person for it. You need to give someone this responsibility and then let them figure it out as they go because the host needs do differ from church to church. And I, I understand that this can be a challenging part of these kinds of episodes because people are like, well, I don't have a host in my church. Like, how do we do it? And we can talk about personal experience from our own churches where we've done these things, but your needs might differ. Mm. And that's why, if nothing else, putting someone in charge of it and then evaluating how it's gone. And we're in the middle of a brand new project on YouTube right now, Pro Church Tools Inc. It's a brand new type of YouTube video where we're doing some teaching content, mm -hmm. but we're also kind of pulling the curtain back to show you behind the scenes of running this company. You know, we'd run it for 10 years and we were entering a new decade of the company. Hey, let's show you what we've been building and show you all the people and tackle this crazy project of giving 1,000 church websites free makeovers by the end of 2025. And guess what? This brand new style of video is totally different than other videos that I've done. Mm. And so... I don't really have a roadmap for it. I don't have a blueprint for it in the same way that you might not have a blueprint or a roadmap for a host. So what do I do? I take from someone else and like, this is what they've done. Okay, great. We're going to have some word for word scripts for you. We're going to have a framework for this. That's very rough. Do that. And then evaluate. Mm. Every time we finish and publish one of these videos, I make, I'm making notes. Okay. Here's what people seem to like. Here's what people seem to not resonate with as much. Here's what I didn't like. Here's how this production could have been faster. Here's what we missed on this. And every time we do it, we get better. And guess what? Once we've been through 100 episodes, people are going to think, wow, wow, these, these videos are really good. Well, they weren't originally, mm. or by our standards at episode 100, mm -hmm. episodes one through mm -hmm. seven won't be, but we're learning every single time from it. Same thing for the host. Install it, evaluate, make tweaks. Six months down the road, okay, we fully understand what this is meant to look like in our church. We can't understand what it's fully meant to look like in your church, but we can give you some kind of rough guidelines. What about this pushback? Because you mentioned it earlier, the live theater, uh, flicking the lights to come back to your seats. Is this not just uh, something from the secular world that the modern church is adopting? Well, surely, yes. But, but I also had this YouTube comment. It says this, quote, it's almost like, okay, now let's be clear. This comment, a little bit harsh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's some truth in it, was it delivered in the most uh, humble of ways? Hey, that's for you to decide. Quote, it's almost like non-liturgical churches are finally realizing they really have no idea what they're actually doing. <laughs> oh, <yikes. laughs> the church has used a quote-unquote host for nearly 2,000 years, except it's called a presider. The presider is the worship leader for the whole service. They're, they're leading everything that happens in the service. The presider welcomes the people, leads the prayers, and the entire liturgy. It often also includes the preaching, though not necessarily. They preside at Holy Communion and give us the closing blessing. If you don't divorce yourself from the traditions the church has inherited, then you don't have to make things up as you go. And best of all, the liturgy engages worshipers and flows beautifully, no awkward transition periods. So first of all, okay. if you have the criticism <laughs> that this is something that the church is doing because we're copying the secular world, shame on you. Shame on you. <laughs> for not observing the ancient traditions of the church, perhaps, listener, if you actually studied, okay, <laughs> the, the, the fathers and mothers of the faith that right. came before us, you, you wouldn't- heard of a presider? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, this is, the, the, this is the secular world. No, this is the ancient church, okay? <laughs> We've been doing it for so long. We've influenced so many generations that the secular world has actually stolen it from us, and we're stealing it back. That's right. We're just bringing back the presider. Right. <laughs> Do you see, 
As someone that cares about the ancient traditions and liturgies, uh, is there some merit in this comment? Despite I th- it's, uh... Honestly, I, I think there's a ton of merit to it. Again, on last week's episode, we talked about like printed order of service and asking the question, like, does this deserve a place in our modern worship services? And I, I think this is in the similar vein, which is the liturgical um, church, the mainline church has, um, th- they have rites, they have orders of services, they have liturgy that they follow week after week after week that that really does keep things on track that really does in some in some ways and and they do have a presider they do have a host but in some ways it actually eliminates the need for a host because everyone at church knows what's coming up next and so this rhythm of church um may be foreign to some of our listeners but has been installed for quite a long time and plenty of churches have been happy with the expectation of of that type of service so i think there is merit to the question um regardless regardless of the comment regardless of maybe the the tone (laughs) let's get into some scripting options here uh just reading one that was suggested in the youtube comments before we get into our own quote i remember one time i was at texas roadhouse and they changed the first impression engagement to saying quote how was your last visit with us and that would prompt someone to say either great or this is our first time i thought that would be a better modified greeting option for churches Mm. something to consider so that's one. I prefer to use the word guest over new or visitor. I think guest is a more broad term that is inclusive of more potential people. Mm. If you say just the word new, uh, a person might think to themselves, I'm not included in that. I do prefer new over visitor, which I think is the worst because new could mean first time, but it doesn't necessarily mean first right. time. And first time might be the worst of them all. Certainly the worst. So just simple changes of wording can make a big deal mm. because if you're a church where you don't have new people all the time, you might be like, this doesn't apply to me because I can't say if you're new or if it's your first time because we all know that that doesn't include anyone. Mm-hmm. Okay, but if you say the word guest, that can include someone that brought someone with them. That could include any number of folks that could fall under that category. I think one of the biggest, biggest tips that we can give people has to do with where you point people to take action. Mm. Uh, Every church is going to have different departments, different ministry needs, uh, different strengths and weaknesses with hosts, uh, and so they're going to highlight different things. But what's true for every church is that once you have uh, introduced a ministry, once you have delivered an announcement, there has to be a point where you say, and if you want to get Mm -hmm. get involved, do this. And my time-tested strategy for this is very simple. There are two connect cards in the seat back in front of you. One is green, one is blue. Insert your brand colors as needed. One is black, one is white. One is yellow, one is orange. Whatever your brand colors are. One of those colors is for guests. And so when you're talking about guests, you can say to them, and we'd love to get in touch with you or we'd love to meet you for the first time. Just uh, pick up the blue card Mm -hmm. and scan the QR code in the back or head to the big blue wall in the lobby that says connect. And so now it's very clear for that person, what they need to do Mm -hmm. if they want to get involved. And then you say for the green card, and if you are part of the regular family here, we'd love for you to get connected with all the ministry options we have. Uh, Just scan the QR code on the back of the green card or head to the big green wall in the lobby, or you can say the blue wall again, Mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Having simple color-coded options, one for getting involved for the first time, other for taking your current next step, and using those, this is the key, as the only calls to action Mm -hmm. over and over and over again is how you inspire people to take action. And this is what most people miss. It won't work like that the first time, but the language you use becomes the culture that you build. So as you've said that for 14 straight Sundays, when it's finally, you know, Martha's time to get involved Mm -hmm. and the first two things weren't relevant to her or she didn't care, it has been ingrained into her exactly where she needs to go. Now you're limiting the amount of feedback from folks. I didn't even know that was happening or I didn't know where to go Mm -hmm. because it's ingrained into the culture because your next step call to action is always identical every week. So give it to me. You're Brady at Central. You're playing host. You get up on stage. What are you saying? So this has morphed and evolved over the years. Um, but when I'm introducing myself for the first time, Mm -hmm. one of my simplest things I like to say is, well, hey there, nice, (laughs) which I, (laughs) 
<laughs> well, hey there. Welcome to church this morning. So happy you chose to spend part of your Sunday with us. Nice. Uh, that's kind of my favorite way to kick things off, mm-hmm. uh, whether I'm coming out a few minutes before the countdown ends, whether I'm coming out you know, at the very top of service and then we're jumping mm-hmm. into worship, whether that's kind of like in between, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, but I think that's uh, one of the just simplest ways. I think anyone can copy that script uh, and install it. But that's a simple thing. Like mm-hmm. get the cards right, mm-hmm. get the next steps right. That is the key for people taking action. Mm -hmm. Um, Because at the end of the day, people get confused when you point them to all these different spots, like app this, website, email, track down a church. You know, we were talking about um, one of our employees the other day who was was talking about, he didn't know which pastor to track down after service because he wanted to ask about youth. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I don't know which one was the youth pastor. And I thought to myself, huh, like, I feel like if that church had properly said, like, and if you want to take your next step, go to the big green wall in the lobby, like, he would have went there directly Mm -hmm. and he wouldn't have like tried to figure out which of the pastors was the student pastor if you had just communicated clearly where to go to take your next step. Right. When it's consistent, what people in the congregation quickly learn is that irrespective of what next step they want to take, irrespective of what ministry that they want to get involved in, what question that they have, they'll always go to that same place. And as that culture gets built, communications becomes more streamlined. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that we care about fluidity, why? For the purpose of life change and next steps. When communication is streamlined, you remove hurdles for people taking action. Mm -hmm. They take more action. Yeah. That's what we want. There you go. All right, finally, let's talk about host behavior, okay? Again, word for word scripts, useful, highlight them. How they get applied, it's going to be unique to your church, Mm -hmm. but how you uh, carry yourself on stage is going to be, uh, should be the same for everyone. The important thing to remember when you're on stage is that you need to exaggerate your physical gestures and expressions. When you're talking one-to-one to to person uh, in real life, it's intimate. And if you were waving your hands the way you would on stage, it'd be awkward. That's the right feeling to have when you're on stage. The reason people fail to deliver that well often is because you're by yourself on that stage Mm -hmm. and you can kind of feel like you're being silly. But to communicate those gestures to an entire room of many people, even a small church, like 50 people, like one to 50, you have to be more over the top than you would be one to one. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean louder. No, no, because you're likely on a microphone. So, but, but. But the way you're physically acting yes. is kind of like exaggerated. Yeah. Um, if you're on video, this is not true. Video is like a one-to-one medium. Video feels more intimate. If you're over-the-top expressive on video, that will not translate mm-hmm. in the same way and will seem contrived. And uh, we've all seen that. Uh, remember to smile. I have recently got this feedback from a person, and uh, they were right. Like, you know, you tend to be a little bit serious. It's okay to smile. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I feel really forced when I'm smiling. They're like, yeah, but this is looking good. And I was like, okay, great. Be friendly. Mm -hmm. If you have a downturned mouth like myself, know yourself. (laughs) Know your limitations and work to counteract them. And then finally, hold the mic in a consistent spot. You know, if you start speaking really loudly and you are good with mic technique, you'll know, okay, I can move the mic a little bit away. But there should be that same resting spot for the mic because you're speaking at the same tone. 90% of the time or Mm -hmm. 80% of the time. So for me, what I always like to do is I like to hold directly kind of like against my chin. Me too. Oh yeah, that's it. That way it's like a mark for like shooting arrows. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, well, I don't need to tell you. You got it. You hold it back and you always like hold it like right, Mm -hmm. the same spot. It's called an anchor point. So that way you know I'm always releasing it from the exact same spot. And you're doing your sound person a really big favor if you're consistent with the mic. So whether it's your anchor point is on your chin or if you're Judah Smith and it's down your belly button, either way, you're doing your sound sound person a favor by keeping it in the same spot. Right. And so then what they'll do is they'll set the baseline for, okay, their voice is at this decibel and this is where they hold the mic. And so if they get really loud they'll know it's like, oh, like, I don't know what Judah does. Does he just like throw it to somebody else so he can, like, uh, he's already holding it all the way well, down. I told there. you I have a conspiracy theory about that. That he's mic'd up and it's just a prop? Yeah, that he's got a lapel somewhere. Because he sa- it sounds so good. So he's got a lapel somewhere. Whether it's one of those hair mics from like live theater or if it's like in his in his collar, like just really skillfully placed. Put it on and, his glasses. And the hand, yeah, and the handheld mic is, just, they're big enough. You could, you could fit a microphone awesome. on there. The uh, handheld mic is just a prop. That's my conspiracy theory. You know, we spoke. Everyone gets one conspiracy theory. That one's mine. We spoke with the church home people. Like, why didn't we ask this question when we had had a chance? We blew it. In the comments. (laughs) Let us know. Does Judas Smith, pro-church people, (laughs) use the mic as a prop and he has a secret lapel? Or is there some type of sound witchcraft happening on 
<laughs> in the Pacific Northwest. And you just have the best sound person in LA on Judah's mic. Let us know. Seven uh, characteristics and qualities of a great host. Appreciate your time, your attention, and your trust. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs> My daughter comes up to me at the end of the day. You know, it's summer. She's like, I had a popsicle, and then I had these gummies, and then I had another popsicle, and then we got ice cream, and then Miliana came over, and she had a snack for me, and then I'm seeing my friend Kate, and we're gonna get more ice cream. She's like, and she's like, oh, my tooth got to hurt. I'm like, yeah, yeah, man. yeah. <laughs>